Hello everybody, my name is Kai Wehner and I work as technology evangelist for TIPCO. Today I want to discuss with you the differentiation between data pre-processing and data wrangling in machine learning and deep learning projects. So as you can see on the bottom right side, this is getting very important. So data preparation is the key term for preparing data sets in your machine learning projects. But um, there's really no differentiation between data pre-processing and data wrangling. And data wrangling is more the new term and it's a different topic um, with different tools and technologies. And I want to discuss with you how you can do both and when to use which framework or tool. For this, the key takeaways of the session for data preparation and data science. Various languages, frameworks and tools for data preparation are available as we will see in this presentation. And of course, all of them have their trade-offs and so you have to think about when to use which one. Data wrangling is as important uh, as an add-on to data pre-processing. So it's best used within visual analytics tools but can also be used outside of that. Visual analytics and open source data science components are complementary. That's also what I will show you shortly, so um, how you can combine them. And what's also very important, what we see from our customers, is that you should avoid numerous components um, to speed up a data science project. So you really have to think about how many different tools and languages you use in a project. With that, let's take a look at the agenda, which looks pretty big, but I will only go into a um, high overview about the different topics, so it's not too long. And um, I will begin with a discussion of what data pre-processing and data wrangling is. And then I will shortly show the Kaggle Titanic dataset, which is used in many data science projects for learning. And with that, I will walk you through a few different options for doing data pre-processing and data wrangling. As you can see here, that's also then for different user roles like the data scientist or the business analyst or the developer. And for that, I want to show you many different frameworks and tools and when to use which one. Let's begin with the discussion about the need for data pre-processing and data wrangling. First of all, the key goal of data science projects is to have a closed loop for doing from insight to action, so that you find insights and patterns in historical data, and then you can apply these insights you have found into rules or machine learning models, which you can then apply to real-time processing. This can be used for many scenarios like fraud detection or cross-selling or predictive maintenance. I have a lot of other talks where I talk about this topic and use cases in more detail. With that, we have a lot of tasks to do and as you can see here, this is always a closed loop. You access data, you prepare it and build a model and then you deploy it to production and leverage their insights. And then this loop closes again to improve the model and so on. And as you can see here, um, data preparation is a key part, of course, of building an analytic model. So it's a very important part for data uh, science with machine learning or also deep learning and that's also the motivation for the session here. If you take a look at the um, analyst reports like Gartner and Forrester, there are many different um, magic quadrants and Forrester waves like the advanced analytics platforms, um, the data integration tools, BI and analytics and now also very new what Forrester calls the insights platform which does exactly what I show you on the last slide together in one platform. And with that, um, data preparation gets more and more important in the meantime. But what's also very important to understand is that um, there is some kind of demystification of data science for the business analyst. Gartner calls this the smart data discovery. And that simply means that more people will be able to use data science, to use machine learning without the help of the expert. And therefore, the tools will support you by doing that. We will see later what that means when the tools get more intelligent and get smarter to do recommendations for you in the background. So, of course, in the beginning this was implemented by a data scientist, but business analysts can now leverage that um, without help of anyone. And that is, of course, increasing and improving more and more. This is just the beginning of smart data discovery today. 
There are many different user roles uh, which are involved in a data science project. Um, the business user who has the knowledge about the data, the data scientist or citizen data scientist. Um, the citizen doesn't mean that it's not a deep expert, but he's able to do some uh, analytic model building and so on with some tooling support. And the developer who deploys it into production afterwards. There's a lot of tools around here. So you have uh, visual analytics, you have data science, streaming analytics. A lot of that is already um, built in AI driven. That means that you can use it easily with um, intelligence under the hood. And you have a lot of frameworks like R or Python, Spark, um, which you can use, and also tools like RapidMine or Tipco, Spotfire, for example. And that's basically what I want to show you in more detail. Data preparation is the key term, and in the end, it's in between the raw data on the left side and the model output which you build in your machine learning project on the right side. And it contains two parts. It's about data cleaning and it's about feature engineering. That's the two parts of data preparation. And that's in the end really the heart of data science. You need a domain knowledge, you need experience in data science and data preparation. And this can take up to 60 to 80% of the whole analytical pipeline of the project. But it's very important to get the best accuracy of your analytic model. And also, and usually it cannot be fully automated. And therefore, this is a very important step. And that's what I want to talk about with different frameworks and tools. Data cleaning as one part of data preparation is the typical things you know, like um, selection and filtering data, doing transformations or binning, data replacement, um, imputation for replacing, missing observations. There's a lot of different things to do here. And on the other side, you have feature engineering, where you really um, build some kind of new attributes and features out of the existing data set by using your domain knowledge. And um, with that, you really create the attributes which then help building a very good model. Actually, feature engineering is already part of model building, but also it needs data preparation steps. Like you can see here in this um, screenshot, when you want to use splitting for getting data out of one single column to create a new feature, for example, and then you use data preparation again here. The steps are typically of feature engineering that you do some brainstorming and then decide which features to use and then um, prepare the features in a way that they work for you and then you check out if that works for your analytic model and this is also a closed loop um, where you improve your features and here data preparation is needed. So the analytical pipeline in the end begins with getting access to your data and then doing pre-processing, analysis and then model building before you deploy it to production. If you think about that again from the data preparation perspective, um, the first part is data pre-processing. This is when you access the data and then you prepare it to do some initial, initial exploratory data analysis. This is already very important and you need some good tools or frameworks to implement this. But then, um, when you continuously want to improve your analysis and your model building, then you do data wrangling. And the key difference here is that that's typically done by the business analyst and not just by the data scientist to prepare the data. Or it can be done, of course, by data scientist. But both of them usually use it while um, taking a look at the visualization, while taking a look at the data in more detail. So it's simply a different step than just doing data pre-processing in the beginning when you um, get the data from your data sources. And you, typically you need both in data science projects to build a good analytic model. Let's take a look at our reference architecture for building analytic models. On the bottom you see um, in pink, here is where you do historical analytics. The data may be in Hadoop, in a data warehouse or somewhere else. And you find insights and patterns by using data discovery tools, visual analytics, and also um, advanced analytics like machine learning or deep learning to build your analytic models. And then you deploy them into real-time processing. So here in blue, you see the streaming analytics components where you deploy your rules or analytic model to act on new data then. 
And if we think about this from data preparation step, there's a lot of things where you can do some kind of data preparation. Uh, this can be classical data preparation before you get the data into your um, analytics tool, like with R or Python or uh, tools like NIME or RapidMiner, you can do data preparation. You can use big data preparation, for example, Hadoop's MapReduce or Apache Spark to prepare big data sets. And um, then you also have the classical ETL tools for get your data sources. You can also use streaming analytics for doing data pre-processing. And finally, you have data wrangling where you do the interactive preparation of your data while the data is already um, there for the business analyst and data scientist to build your model and improve your data sets for this. So there's a lot of different components and that's what I want to discuss with you in more detail in this session today. For that, I want to show you shortly the uh, Hydenic dataset of Kaggle, which is very famous and many people use it for learning data science, for learning how to build machine learning models. And therefore, I think it's a great example to use here. The dataset is available on the Kaggle website and it's a relative simple dataset. So here, it's really about the Titanic and if people survived or not. And it is used to predict for a new data set if people would survive or die. And here you see um, the columns like name, sex, age, and so on. So pretty simple data set. And here is an example of it. You can see, for example, what um, data scientists will do then. They will prepare, for example, the name to prepare new features. Like here you can read the first name and then the, the title and then the last name. And um, for that you want to, for example, extract the Mr. or Mrs. into a new feature because here you can analyze um, what sex it is. Or you can do some data um, conversions, for example, the age is actually an integer instead of a, a, a double here. Or you want to aggregate different data sets, like here you have the sisters um, which you have, the siblings, the spouses, um, or you have the parents and children which are in this um, column here and you want to add it together to find out how many people you traveled with. Like here in the last line it's 3 plus 1 plus yourself, so it's 5. Because this is, as we found out, very relevant to your survival probability on the Titanic ship. Some examples again here for quality improvement of this initial data set. You can extract data, you can aggregate data, you can create new columns, you can remove duplicates in a data set, you can add data to non-available um, columns or information using for example imputation, um, like adding the average for the age or replacing empty values with a U for unknown. And you just can, can use more specific data science function like um, scaling or normalizing or use more advanced technologies like PCA or BoxCox. And all of that um, is a part of data preparation. Very important when I now talk about the different options available, of course there are some overlapping. So you can do some things with many different of the tools, like you can do feature extraction with the data pre-processing languages like R or Python. You can do it with an ETL tool. You can do it with Apache Spark or Hadoop MapReduce and so on. So there is definitely overlappings and keep that in mind when I show you the tools. Let's now begin um, with the classical step of data pre-processing by the data scientist. This is really about, in the end, coding, where you use programming languages like R or Python. These both are typically used because they have a lot of out-of-the-box features for uh, building the model, but also for the data preparation tasks. However, there are other things like big data frameworks, Hadoop MapReduce or Apache Spark, which you could use for processing and preparing bigger data sets. And there is even some deep learning frameworks which are specific for this kind of machine learning algorithm like um, MXNet or TensorFlow. And they also allow some kind of data preparation specific for their use cases. And there is many, many more. So we will focus on some of the relevant ones which are mostly used, I would say, in projects. These data pre-processing tools in general, but in this case, um, as an example with R, 
are built for the data scientist. So um, here you can use functions like filter, extract, or scaling and shuffling data. And they are built for exploratory data analysis with low-level coding. So here, here the, this is not for the business analyst, but the data scientist uses code, like in R or Python, to do the data preparation. Typically, these languages like R or Python are not built for enterprise scale deployment. If you want to get high performance or scale it out, then you typically use a commercial enterprise scale runtime like typical runtime for R, or you can use Microsoft R, which is former Revolution R. As one example for R, which you can see here, um, this is a typical example of doing data pre-processing with coding, um, like um, here are some feature engineering or um, changing some, um, some, con some types of data, like here factorization of this passenger class or the survival data. And then you do things like splitting, um, like here on the top and the bottom. That's the typical task which you can do with coding. The disadvantage of this is that it's, um, as I said, low-level coding, so um, some people um, like it, but on the other side, it's tougher to um, review, to um, do maintenance on that, and to find errors, and also to hand it over to other colleagues. And um, But it's fine and works for many use cases. So on top of using just a language like R, there are several packages available. For example, the deployer package, which is used to manipulate, clean, and summarize unstructured data. This one is very easy to use, like you can see here at the bottom. Um, there are simple operations like filter, or select, or summarize. And with that, it's much easier than using the plain R features to prepare and pre-process data sets. Or a more powerful example is the carrot package, which also includes several data science-related pre-processing features like um, PCA or Boxcox. And this is a more generic interface, which you can use with a lot of R model implementations with diverse APIs. And you have one generic API on top of that. Therefore, it's a little bit more complex than uh, the one you saw before with Deployer package, but therefore it's also more powerful. And this is simply the different options you have as a data scientist with R. And the same is true for Python, for example. Let's take a short look at some source code in more detail. And as I said in the beginning, we always will use the Titanic dataset to see um, the examples. I'm here in R Studio, and I don't want to, to uh, go into too much detail here. I have also linked to the examples where I found um, the source code. So here in R Studio, you already see um, we read some data sets for the training, and then we um, do some data pre-processing before later we build the analytic model. And so you can see here um, how we combine different data sets and how we change um, types, for example, to um, use a factor for the um, survived and passenger class. And if you go more to the, uh, to the bottom, let's see here. Um, so for example, you can do a replace empty cabins with a U for unknown. This is typical data pre-processing. Or you can, for example, um, let's see here for parse out, parse out last names and typo. So here you can see where, see where we do some splitting. And this is the typical examples um, which you do in data pre-processing with R. And as you can see simply in this example, um, it's a more sophisticated example, but it's for the simple Titanic data set. And here already you have a lot of source code which you will use. And therefore, it's not really easy to maintain this and to write new code. And therefore, it's not for every persona. So as a data scientist, some people love it, and for them it works pretty good. And um, it's one way of doing data pre-processing here in R. And with Python, it would look very similar. So let's go back to the presentation. As I said, if you want to see more details about this, um, I have also linked to the um, code examples in this video and in the presentation. And there is much more available on this um, in the internet about doing data pre-processing, of course. So um, then there is also the data pre-processing with using big data frameworks like Apache, Hadoop, MapReduce, or Apache Spark. They are more built also for the developer. This can be a data scientist or a classical developer who uses Scala or Java code. The key advantage here is really for scaling out and doing big data processing. 
R or Python are typically not built um, for big data sets or terabytes or even more. And therefore, often you have an interface from R or Python to these big data frameworks so that you can do the data processing of bigger data sets. This also focuses on the low level coding. As one example, I have here um, the Titanic dataset again with Apache Spark, where we do some data pre-processing and some feature engineering with Scala code in this example. And as you can see here on the right side, it's again not that easy, for example, to extract all these different um, titles from the um, name of the uh, passengers. And um, this is not really comfortable in encoding here in Scala because Scala does not have out of the box um, the, all of these feature and data pre-processing uh, extraction features. And therefore, um, you can do it this way, but it's, I think, not the perfect way. But if you want to use just Spark, for example, and then scale it out to do the pr data pre-processing at all the different data sets, then it's still a fine way to do it this way with writing code with Apache Spark. So another option is to data pre-processing by the citizen data scientist. Of course, this can then also be used by the data scientist, but even by personas which fetch not that much experience with using R or Python or so. So um, the tools I will talk about here are really focused on ease of use and time to market and agility. They are pretty easy to use. You use typically visual coding and code generation. And under the hood, you can still leverage other frameworks like R or Apache Spark or H2O AI. Um, that can run under the hood, but the, the data scientist, uh, the user itself, does not see much of that because he uses um, visual tooling for that. For example, you could use NIME, which is pretty nice and sophisticated tooling for doing data pre-processing, as you can hear on these screenshots. Or you can use Rapid Miner, which is another example. Um, here you see um, implementations again of the Titanic data set where um, I do some filtering. As you can see here, it's a graphical component or some more complex advanced stuff like distance based outlier detection. The nice thing here is um, Rapid Miner, for example, has many visual machine learning operators and also intelligent recommendations. So really under the hood here again, machine learning is used to recommend you the next steps of what you want to do in data preparation and, and so on. And therefore, um, it's really comfortable to do this, even if you're not an experienced data scientist. And even under the hood, you can use also Hadoop or Spark and so on. That's um, pretty nice. So let's take a look um, shortly at Rapid Miner again and how to use that with the Titanic data set. Here, um, the nice thing about um, Rapid Miner is also that it out of the box uses the Titanic dataset for most of its tutorials if you want to learn the tool. So it's a perfect fit for my scenario. And I just here built one of the many examples you have used, like um, doing some filtering and sorting here. And all you do is you import the Titanic dataset here as first click, and then you use the sort and filter components. Like you can see here, there's many components for data preparation and pre-processing, like filtering, sampling, sorting, and also things for cleansing, like normalization, binning, removing duplicates. And then of course, also all the modeling and scoring features are here and they are all drag and drop. And then you just uh, double click and configure this here, like adding a filter, like sex um, equals female. And even if you don't have the female in, it's intelligent enough to recommend you female and male because these are the two values which are there in the data set. And this is what I meant with the tools are getting smarter and smarter with doing recommendations for you. And here on the bottom you see um, what Rapid Miner calls wisdom of the crowds. Here you see recommendations, that's what other users use next here as a component. And therefore the tool supports you by doing all these data pre-processing and model building steps. And therefore that's pretty nice. And then you can simply run this process and you see here the outcome, which is a new data set with the data preparation I did. In this case, I filtered by female, so I only see them. And I sort by having the um, highest um, passenger price first. That's just one example, of course, and you can do much more powerful things. And then you have a lot of um, ease of use with the graphical coding, with handing it over to colleagues or taking a look at this code um, maybe six weeks later. And therefore, um, that's a pretty nice example um, of doing um, visual coding here. So that's um, a pretty nice. 
And so um, here we saw this example. Now let's go back to the um, presentation. Here we go to the next step and that's now the key difference to data pre-processing which we saw now. Um, where we did it either with R or Python by data scientist or we leveraged a tool like RapidMiner or Nime for, um, so that more people can use it and that you have ease of use and visual coding and so on. Now let's talk about data wrangling which can also be used by the business analyst and that's the key difference here. And data wrangling is built for everybody. So here even um, the people without technical knowledge can do some kind of data preparation. And really data wrangling is focused even more on ease of use than these tools like RapidMiner or Nime. Um, and examples here are Data Wrangler or Tree Factor or Tipco Spotfire, which you can use for that. Here's one screenshot of Tree Factor Wrangler. Um, and here you can already see this is pretty simple. It looks a little bit like Microsoft Excel. And you can simply do filtering and doing changes um, like a business user wants to do it. So it's very agile and um, it's without technical knowledge. However, what's even more important in the meantime is the so-called inline data wrangling. Because inline data wrangling, that it can be done during the exploratory analysis of data. So here you use data wrangling and visual analytics within one tool. So the business analyst um, can use both with the same tool and that's the pretty big advantage. Like I can show you in a minute with Tipco Spotfire. And the key really, as I um, have from this um, analyst report here, it says when analysts are in the middle of discovery, stopping everything and going back to another tool is jarring. It breaks their flow. They have to come back and pick up later. And productivity plummets and creative energy crashes. And that's the key motivation why, for example, tools like Tipco Spotfire have the inline data ranking within the visual analytics tools so that you can do both in the same tool. And that means, as you can see here on the right side, that you have one integrated tool to do that instead of using different tools for combining that, where you have one tool for doing the data wrangling. It can still be done by the business user, right? Um, but then you have another tool for the analytics part. So data wrangling by the business user and also analysis by the user as two tools. And as we have seen before, that's not a perfect flow for the business analyst to find new insights and patterns. And therefore, what I think is that both in one tool is really a huge benefit for the business analyst to get um, the best value out of the tooling. Here is one example of Tipco Spotfire where we leverage both. Um, here you see some um, inline data wrangling for um, doing data preparation, but it's also combined with the visual analytics parts. And here really you have one flow and can interactively take a look at the graphics and analyze there and do it interactively and also do data preparation. Uh, in the background what's also generated is some data lineage so that you can also do what kind of data um, wrangling you do here in line the visual analytics tool. Let's take a look at uh, that in more detail. Here I have Tipco Spotfire started and I will also once again import um, the Titanic data set as you can see here which it recommends to me. And like we have seen in RapidMiner, um, Tipco Spotfire is also already very intelligent and is AI driven. So for the business analyst without any knowledge of machine learning, you can leverage that. Like for example, you can click on some of these um, uh, columns here and it generates for you smart recommendations of how you want to visualize the data. So you don't even have to think about that in the beginning. So, and that's one of a few very powerful features so how that business analysts can easily get started with starting their analysis. However, I do not want to focus too much on the visualization part here. Um, if you want to understand more about visual analytics with Spotfire, please um, take a look at many other examples. I want to show you the inline data wrangling here, um, which I combine with the um, visual analytics. Let's take a look at one example, H. And here already you see um, that a lot of information is shown you. Here is a histogram um, with the data of the age and you can already click on that and then it's part of your visual analysis where you can then interactively dig into it and do analysis. And also it shows a lot of statistics for you already, like the minimum and maximum, the median, um, how many unique values, um, all of these things, um, which in R or Python where you code, um, it's a lot of effort to do all that. And therefore here you have it out of the box for the business user. 
And after you have um, done this, you can also do change things here. Like we see, um, age is not really an, a real data type, but it's an integer and you can change that here so um, that it's updated. Or you can replace empty values. So let's say in this case with the um, average value. And when I click this, on the right side you will see how automatically the visual analytics tool also adapts this so that your analysis continuously flows from data preparation and inline wrangling to the exploratory visualization. And that's the cool part here. And with that, um, you can also, for example, here do things like zoom in and zoom out. And again, you see on the right side, the visual analyzation part already adapts these changes. And that makes it very easy for business users to do things here. And you can do more powerful things here. Like, let's uh, take a look at the name. And here in the name, we see it's a more complex name here. So, um, and what we want to extract is the Mr. and Mrs. So to get the information which sex it is, is it male or female? And here again, you see the unit counts and you see this is a category value. So this is automatically organized here between numbers and categories and identifiers. And here um, we can also do a split. And here again, it's smart recommendations implemented uh, under the hood. So again, AI driven for the business user smart data discovery. It automatically recommends to you how to split this up. In this case, it's pretty simple with the comma, but this also works in more sophisticated use cases. And here now we split it up between the um, last name and first name. And here is the result out of it. And we wanna do that again, because in this case now we wanna split out the Mr. and the Mrs. And um, let's do it here. So now we see we have easily extracted our Mr. and Mrs. out of this. If you want to do that with coding with our Python, it's much more effort. And therefore, this is done by the business user here. You see, um, it generates an uh, um, expression here. And of course, you can also do very powerful things here, also manual stuff if it's not supported by the tooling out of the box. And with that, you have seen that um, inline data wrangling is so important for the business user so that you can use just one tool for both for um, inline preparation and also for visual analyzation and combine all of that with each other. Let's go back to the presentation here. Um, this was in the end now about the classical data preparation for machine learning projects where we have either Python or R or tools like RapidMiner or NIME, or you do data wrangling, um, maybe even inside the analytics tool or with other tools like TreeFactor. And now let's also talk why ETL and other tools might be important for, um, for data preparation. So um, data flow pipelines or ETL, extract transform load, that's typically also sometimes the first part when you extract data sets from more um, complex infrastructures like from legacy systems or from ERP systems. Then sometimes a tool like NIME or RapidMiner is not the right tool to start with, but you need really a powerful ETL tool. Like for example, open source talent or Pentaho or something proprietary like Informatica, where you really can do, as you can see here on the right side, very powerful transformations. That's what these tools are built for. Therefore, they are also built for the developer, which knows a little bit about coding, but also leverages visual coding. And um, this is done for the more powerful things. And it also typically supports frameworks like Apache, Hadoop or Spark, so that you can even do ETL from, uh, with these big data frameworks. And here is one example of Pentaho. Again, if you Google for it, I found quickly an example with a uh, um, Titanic dataset. And this looks pretty similar to NIME or RapidMiner, but really um, Pentaho or Talent focus more on ETL, on the more complex integration parts. And they simply have a different persona and different scenarios where you would use them before you do the real analytics part with a tool like Tipco Spotfire or R or Python uh, to build an analytic model. And what's also very interesting is the data ingestion and streaming analytics part. Um, so here you see the streaming analytics processing pipeline. So um, here you use um, input data like sensors or social feeds, um, whatever the data is, and ingest it, and then you do pre-processing. Um, and afterwards you do the powerful streaming analytics parts like um, sliding windows, contextual rules, 
or applying machine learning models here. Um, and the key point here is that you can also use this as data pre-processing in your um, preparation for machine learning and data science projects. Um, one of the key benefits here is that you can use the same tooling here for doing the streaming analytics part, so for real-time processing of events, where you also need data preparation like filtering or transformation or aggregation. And you can use the same processes for the ETL part, for the ingestion in the beginning, before the data scientist can take a look at the data with R or Python or with NIME or before the business analyst takes to Spotfire or Visual Analytics to analyze the data. And so you can use um, a smaller tool stack by using the same tool for streaming analytics and for data preparation. So here are some open source examples like Apache NiFi, Streamsets or CastGate Writer, which you can use for streaming ingestion and preparation. And again, you can do that for batch and for real time. That's the huge benefit. You can do both with these tools. Or you use real streaming analytics tools like open source tools, Apache Flink, Apache Storm, Apache Apex, and many more. Or you use some commercial tooling like Tipco Streambase or IBM Streams, Softwareity, AppHammer. So a lot of options are available. And I can't go into too much detail here. So if you are interested in more about this, um, I have another um, video recording and slide deck where I talk mostly about streaming analytics and also then data preparation of these streaming tools. One example here is Tipco Streambase, where we again um, integrate and transform and prepare the Titanic data set. As you can see here, again, it's visual coding and you do some configuration for the data preparation. Let's also take a look at this. I go to Tipco Streambase and here um, we have some implementation flow where we ingest the data set again. Um, here you can see all the data types and every of these components has an input and an output flow with the different information like the passenger class, name, sex, age and so on. And then here you can also do data preparation like replacement, for example the cabin field and add a new for your unknown if the value is empty. And in the same way you can now implement this for both for batch and for stream processing in real time. And therefore you can implement the same implementation and logic for doing the initial ETL um, and, and where the data scientist gets the data for doing data preparation and analysis with our Python and so on. But you can use the same flows then later for real-time processing when you want to apply the analytic model which was built before by the data scientist and where again for new data, it may be sensor data or social data, you also need to do the data preparation in real-time and therefore it's a perfect combination to use streaming analytics for both for batch and ETL, and then later for real-time processing. And here I don't need to go into too much detail, it's very similar. So here um, you have the implementation, and then as one example you see here the test data set, which has the cabin with some empty values, and this streaming flow simply adds um, the U for unknown here. right? And that can be done for both for the ETL part in the beginning, but also later for real-time processing, because new events also miss the U for unknown here. And then you can apply the analytic models here with the correct and uh, prepared data set too here. With that, let's go back to the presentation and summarize the key takeaways of this session for data preparation and data science. There are various languages, frameworks and tools available for data preparation. All of them have their trade-offs um, included, like Python and R for coding, like RapidMiner or Nine for doing some more visual stuff for data science. You have the big data frameworks like Spark and Hadoop and some visual analytics tools and data wrangling tools for the business analyst. Data wrangling as important that on to data pre-processing is a huge advantage because then um, it's easier also for the business analyst and best case is probably if you really can do the inline data wrangling in the visual analytics tool so that the business analyst has just to use one tool for both for data wrangling and for visual analysis of the data.
Visual analytics and open source data science components are complementary. So, for example, we often see customers combining visual analytics together with both with R and Python, but also with H2O or Apache Spark for big data analytics, and also with other tools like Nine or RapidMiner. You can perfectly combine them for the use cases and they work together. Often the visual analytics tool is used on top of the machine learning frameworks like R or Python or Spark so that you have the visual analyzation for analysis and under the hood it calls the tools like Spark and so on for doing data preparation or building the analytic model. They work together pretty well. And also key what we learned from our data science project is that you should avoid numerous components in your project. So that really speeds up a data science project. And a good example here is really what I showed you that you can use the streaming analytics engine for both for the real-time processing, but also for the initial ETL and batch processing to set up the data, to prepare it and hand it over to your data scientist or business user. That's basically my overview about data wrangling and data pre-processing in machine learning and deep learning projects. And if you have any feedback or comments, please um, give me some feedback. Thanks for watching.